In this video, I'm going to share with you the five most popular views on hell, life after death, and what happens when we die. I want you to comment in the comment section about which view you believe to be the best, and at the end of this video, I will share with you which I believe to be the correct view among them. View number one is what we will call the traditional view of hell. This is the view that the church has held dear and close for millennia. It comes from a literal reading of the Word of God, so we are not introducing any kind of symbolism or metaphorical understanding of hell or anything like that. We will talk about this in the second view, but this is the idea that hell is a literal place, a real place, a physical place where people will be tormented, will be tortured forever, for all eternity. This view derives this idea from the fact that when you look at how the Greek word for eternal is used in certain passages of Scripture, it cannot mean one thing for referring to the state of those who are redeemed and then mean something different regarding those who are not redeemed. For example, if you look at Matthew chapter 25, verse 46, notice that it says this. Jesus says, And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now it is the same Greek word used for eternal life and eternal punishment. So, you cannot read this verse and say, Oh, this means one thing for eternal life, but it means something different for eternal punishment. Therefore, those who adhere to the traditional view of hell also argue that nowhere in the Bible, Old Testament or New Testament, is there any reference to an end to the punishment people will receive if they die separated from Christ. Now, with that said, there is also a caveat here. Those who believe in the view also assert that because God is merciful and just, there will be different levels of punishment regarding hell, but it will still be eternal. Let me give an example of where they derive this. If you look at Luke chapter 12, verses 47 and 48, it says this, And that servant who knew his master's will, but did not prepare himself, or do according to his master's will, will be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know, yet committed things deserving of stripes, shall be beaten with few. For everyone to whom much is given, from him will be required, and to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. So I want you to cross-reference with Matthew chapter 10, verse 15, which says, Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. So we see that Jesus is teaching that there will be levels to this. There will be levels to the type of punishment or the severity of the punishment for those who spend eternity separated from God in hell. They also suggested that hell will be a place that includes physical, emotional, and mental punishment for all eternity. Now, to reinforce their argument that hell will be a place of eternal punishment where you will not die, perish, cease to exist, or be annihilated or burned, or any of those things, I want you to notice how Jesus describes hell. He says, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. You should enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be cast into hell, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. So, notice, if this is a place where even the worms, the maggots, do not die, how could we expect that someone who goes to hell might die or burn as well? Let's continue. The last verse we will look at for the traditional view is Revelation chapter 14, verses 10 and 11, which says, He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Now, with each of these views, I will introduce a concern, if you will, and the concern here is quite obvious. How do we reconcile the fact that God is good with this idea that how can God be good and then watch people burn and torture them for all eternity? 
For this reason then, some people have some problems with the traditional view of hell. View number two is what we will call the metaphorical or psychological view of hell. So, this is the idea that when the Bible mentions hell, it is not a literal place. It is not a real place. It is more about the mental and emotional state of consciousness you will be in regarding being separated from God, but it is not a real place. I mean, it is just a metaphor, it is just a symbol to describe something else, and that something else is more likely related to a metaphor for pain and suffering. So, whenever you see things like heat or fire or bondage or thirst or pain or lashes, all of that is symbolic. It is all metaphorical to describe the kind of pain, guilt, regret, sadness and sorrow that you will experience while you begin to contemplate your life and how many opportunities you had to have been with God and now find yourself on the other side of things, in hell. And now, this pain and sorrow that you have to deal with for the rest of all eternity is like a fire that just never goes out never goes out, and that is what those who adhere to the metaphorical view would say regarding hell. Even the late and famous evangelist Billy Graham described hell in this way, I often wondered if hell is a terrible burning within our hearts for God, to have fellowship with God, a fire we can never quench. Now, to be fair to those who adhere to the metaphorical view, they claim that hell involves conscious eternal punishment but not in the way we think in terms of the traditional view number one. And they will say, well, let me give you some examples of how the Bible contradicts itself regarding hell. One of the things they will say is, well, how can the Bible describe hell as a place of complete darkness and yet a place where the fire never goes out? Let me give an example. Jude 13. They are like wild waves of the sea foaming up their shame, wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. So, clearly, hell is described as a place of complete and black darkness, but it is also described this way in Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, how can hell be a place where there is everlasting fire and also a place that is constantly dark at the same time? This is what they will say. It is kind of metaphorical. And then they will also say, well, if hell is a real place, then how can fire torment spiritual beings? Right. So if you are a spiritual being in hell, you have not been resurrected to your body. Well then, how can you experience torment if you are just a spiritual being and you are in flames? Fire cannot burn spiritual beings. So those who defend this view may make a distinction between torment and torture. You can be tormented forever, but not necessarily tortured. Let me delve a little deeper into this. During the Gospels, Jesus used a term called Gehenna to describe hell. And if you go to Jerusalem, you will see that the Valley of Hinnom, or Gehenna, the Valley of Gehenna, was outside, or at least during the time of Jesus, it was a valley that was outside the city of Jerusalem. Think of it as a large garbage dump. This would be the place where they would throw dead bodies, where they dumped all their garbage, where sometimes people would offer sacrifices or put their children through child sacrifices and things like that. Dead animals from sacrifices offered in the temple would be taken there, the city's sewage would be dumped there, and basically, it was a place that was smelly, it was dirty, and it was not a place where you would want to go. So, Jesus was using this as an example or a metaphor to say, hey, you know how that valley just outside Jerusalem is, right? We take all your garbage and all the dead bodies and all those dead animals, all that stuff, just like you would not want to go there. That's exactly how hell will be. So some from the metaphorical camp will say, well, just as Jesus was using the Valley of Gehenna more as an example of what hell will be, then more likely hell is just more of a metaphor. 
now the obvious concern for the metaphorical view is that the Bible does not seem to suggest anywhere that hell will involve just some kind of conscious mental and emotional torment. It seems to suggest that it will involve physical pain and torture. Let's move on to view number three, which we will call, or the other side of it, annihilation. This is an interesting view that has gained quite a bit of popularity, so for that reason we will delve a little bit here and explain it in detail. Essentially, you could summarize this view with the phrase, let the crime determine the time. They start with the premise that no one is immortal except God, but you don't know what immortality means. It means the ability to live forever, for all eternity. So God is the only immortal being, and therefore God grants to some people, namely Christians, hopefully you and me, the gift of immortality. But by default, when you come into this world, you are not immortal. Your soul is not immortal. So that is the basis you come into the world with. So if you die separated from Christ, you are not immortal, you never were, and therefore you can't be tortured and tormented for all eternity because you were not immortal. Immortality is a gift that comes from the only immortal God, to those who follow Jesus Christ. That would be you and me. We receive that gift to live forever, but those who are not redeemed or unredeemed are not eternal and therefore will not spend eternity in hell. I hope that made sense. So, essentially, you go to hell based on whatever level of crimes or wrongs you committed during this life. And once you have served your time, once you have been severely punished based on how you lived your life, you cease to exist. You burn, you are destroyed, you perish, and you know nothing anymore. And that is the essence of this argument of conditional immortality or annihilation. The logic behind it is quite obvious. How do you harmonize or reconcile, if you will, this moral problem we have with God, is what they would say. That is, if God is a good God, he can't torture people for all eternity, especially when the crimes committed were committed in time. So, why would their punishment need to last for all eternity? If you only lived for 70 years, you could have only committed 70 years of crimes or 70 years of sins. It doesn't make logical sense that God would punish someone for 70 billion years, and even then, you would only be in heaven for a second. It doesn't seem to make logical sense and is inconsistent with the character of God is what they would say. Now, for biblical support, they would basically say, hey, if we are going to take the Bible literally as the traditional view number one would say, then we have to look at words like perish and destroy or destruction. Because when we use these words in our English language, it doesn't mean that something is going to last forever. Food perishes, right? Or when something is destroyed, it doesn't mean it's still around, it's gone, right? It's destroyed, it's completely consumed. Now, let me give an example. John chapter 3 verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish. Right, the idea of perishing, ceasing to exist, being annihilated, is what they would say. Let me give another example. Matthew chapter 10 verse 28 And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. So they would say, look, here is God who can destroy your body, make it cease to exist in hell. A strong proponent of this view, whose name is Clark Pink, writes the following. Eternal torture is morally intolerable because it portrays God acting as a bloodthirsty monster who holds eternal hatred for his enemies, whom he does not even allow to die. How can anyone love such a God? I suppose someone might fear him, but could we love and respect him? Would we want to strive to be like him in his lack of mercy? Now you may ask, wait, Brother Allen, 
How do those who advocate this view explain passages that speak of eternal death? They use a sort of loophole to get around this and say, well, let's say someone ceases to exist. Their punishment is eternal. They will be eternally separated from God. So that is their punishment. They will say, yes, they will die eternally because they will not be eternally tormented but they will be eternally separated from God. So they argued that this would reflect a fairer perspective on how and how long people will be punished in hell. Now, even though this view may seem good, the concern here is, are we making this argument more from a place of reason or logic or opinion, or what we feel God should be doing in our finite minds about what justice looks like or are we using the scriptures to come to our argument? To summarize this view, they would say that hell is a place that one day will be empty because those who go there will go there and serve their time and then cease to exist. Now, the fourth view of hell is what we will call the purgatorial view of hell. This is the view held by Catholics or Roman Catholics. The idea is this. If you commit one of the mortal sins and do not repent, then you go directly to hell. Some people will go there and then there will be a select group of people who will go directly to heaven. Perhaps you have perfectly lived your life. You did the sacraments. You did all these different things. You obeyed God and all that. And then you can go directly to heaven. The rest of the group goes to this intermediate state called purgatory where you will be purged of your sins, but eventually you will ascend to heaven. Now, I will give you the seven basic beliefs about purgatory. 1. Temporary state. The idea is that purgatory is a temporary state of purification rather than a permanent destination. 2. Post-death purification. After you die, you will be purified of your sin. It is believed that the souls in purgatory are the souls of the deceased who were not fully purified of their sins before death, but who are not condemned to eternal damnation. 3. Place of purification. It is a process of purification. The souls in purgatory go through a process of cleansing and purification where they will be purged. Hence the word purgatory for the remaining effects of sin and attaining a state of holiness that allows them to enter heaven. 4. Suffering and joy. While in purgatory, it is believed that the souls experience suffering due to the purification process, but there is also a feeling of hope and anticipation of eventually entering heaven. 5. Intercessory prayers. The idea is that, essentially, the living can offer prayers and sacrifices and do good deeds on behalf of those who are dead and in purgatory, alleviating their suffering and speeding up their journey to heaven. This is called prayers for the dead. 6. Divine Mercy The concept of purgatory is rooted in the belief in God's mercy and justice, providing a way for souls to be cleansed, purified, and eventually reach the perfect state necessary for celestial presence. 7. Final Destiny Once the souls in purgatory have been fully purified and are ready for heaven, it is believed they are admitted to the eternal presence of God. So if you are a Protestant or a non-Catholic person, you most likely do not subscribe to the purgatorial view. So, the fifth and final view we will examine is what we will call universalism. This is a view that has been widely discredited and rejected as heresy. The idea here is that the unsaved are tormented in hell temporarily with a series of graduated punishments until they are sufficiently purified to be accepted into heaven. Basically, at some point, everyone who went to hell goes to heaven and God is simply going to have this great happy party because no one will remain in hell forever. Universalism means that everyone goes to heaven, whether they go directly there or go to heaven after having served their time and received their punishment in hell for a certain time. 
This doctrine should be rejected as heresy by anyone who calls themselves a Christian. Okay, so now let me share with you my view. Before that, I want to know in the comments section which views you defend. Is it the traditional view? Is it the metaphorical view? Is it the annihilation view? Is it the purgatorial view? Or is it, I hope not, the universalist view? Right, so my view is the traditional view number one. This is the view that the Church has held dear and close, and also the one I think has the most biblical foundation in terms of foundation. It may not be the one that makes everyone feel good, but also, the caveat is that there will be different levels of punishment for those who go to hell, and that is God's mercy on display. It will not be the same kind of punishment for everyone. The Bible repeatedly warns us about the eternal consequences of our earthly choices. In Matthew 10:28, Jesus advises us, And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. This verse is not just a warning about God's power, but also a call to reflect on how we are living our lives. Hell is described as a place of eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels, Matthew 25, 41, and it is a destination for those who stray from God's ways. This shows us the seriousness of the moral and spiritual choices we make every day. Therefore, how should we live in light of these truths? First, it is essential to recognize and confess our sins, seeking God's forgiveness through Jesus Christ, who died to save us from the grip of sin and eternal death. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1.9 This is the promise that brings us hope. Additionally, we should strive to live lives that reflect God's love and holiness, positively influencing those around us. Ephesians 5, 8, 10 exhorts us, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Finally, as followers of Christ, we are called to share the good news of the gospel, not only to save others from eternal judgment, but to bring them to the fullness of life in Christ. As Paul reminds us in Romans 10, 13, 14, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Let this reflection serve as both a warning and encouragement. May we be bright lights in a world that walks in the shadows, guiding the lost to the love and mercy that can only be found in Christ Jesus. And as we consider hell, let us do so with a heart turned not towards fear, but towards transformation and redemption that are possible through God's divine grace. Wherever you stand, I want to encourage you to use Scripture as a solid foundation for your perspective, and that way you will know that this is what you believe and why you believe it, not based on logic, reason or opinion, but on Scripture. So what does this mean for you and me regardless of your view on hell? It's that it is a place we don't want to go, and we don't want our loved ones, our friends, our co-workers or our neighbors to go. This means that you and I need to be on a mission about sharing the gospel, evangelizing, and telling people the truth so they can spend eternity with God and not be separated from God. I hope you enjoyed this video and learned a little more about the five views of hell. Until next time, bye for now. We have reached the end of our video and I hope you like it. If you're looking for inspiration, knowledge and spiritual connection, don't let this opportunity pass you by. Subscribe to our channel now, leave your like and comment to strengthen our community. And if you want to help us continue sharing religious stories that touch hearts, become a channel member. Together we can make a difference and strengthen our spiritual journey. We're counting on you.
We've left the link in the description of this video so you can become a member today. Continue watching videos about the history of the Bible. I will leave two recommendations here on the screen. God bless you. We will get to the next video.